Hello, uh, my name is Gopal Rao and I'm the editor of MRS Bulletin with the Materials Research Society. Uh, and today I'm very pleased to be uh, speaking with Dr. Matt Coppell. Uh, Matt is a research staff member at the IBM TJ Watson Research Center. He is an expert in the structural characterization and nanoscale analysis of advanced electronic systems. Uh, Dr. Coppell is also the current MRS Vice President this year and will be president of MRS in 2020. Matt, it's a pleasure um, and thanks for talking with us today. I'd like to start with a topic that appears to be very popular in materials research and also at the MRS meetings and in our publications. We are hearing more and more about neuro neuromorphic devices uh, and in fact MRS Bulletin is planning a team issue on this topic next mm -hmm. year. Mm -hmm. What are the main approaches and why is uh, material science so critical to their yeah. success? So, um, okay, so first I'm going to give you a little bit of background because there's some very specific neuromorphic devices that are really hot in industry right now. Um, and, and the deep background is that in the last couple of years, uh, neural networks have had a remarkable amount of success. Um, the, the application that really put them on the map recently was Google Translate, that that could be done with a neural net sort of program. Um, now when you think of a neural net, okay, there are various nodes that are coupled together with some coupling constant, okay? And determining that coupling constant is a key to getting these things to work well. All right, now let's go to the device picture. The device picture is right now that's all done in software, okay? But what, think about how much better it would be if instead of doing all in software, you actually had a hardware implementation. Mm -hmm. So um, instead of having a constant someplace in the program, you actually have a variable resistor that connected the two nodes together. So think of just like a potentiometer, that you're going to tweak it and tune the potentiometer until you get the right coupling constant and, and the English sentence appears in French, okay, or whatever it is that you want to do. Interesting. Okay. So that's sort of the driving force for it. Now, it turns out that a lot of physics isn't terribly linear and a lot of material science isn't terribly linear. So um, the tricky thing is to try to make these things so they behave linearly. Now, um, I'll go through a couple of, of the um, really strong contenders for making this kind of device. Right? That was the original question, I think. Okay, so sort of one of the leading contenders um, is based on a technology called RRAM, which is resistive uh, random access memory. Mm -hmm. So the idea here is taking, instead of a good solid insulator, taking a kind of leaky insulator, um, and then by applying voltage, push around oxygen vacancies to change it um, from being an insulator to a conductor and back and forth. Okay. This is a really heavily, heavily developed approach. A lot of people are betting on this one. Now the drawbacks are it's, it's highly nonlinear. Um, it's stochastic, so you, you're never quite sure what you're going to get. All right. Um, uh, so, so those are sort of the scary aspects of it. So then there's another technology um, which is based on phase change memory. Mm -hmm. And phase change memory has been highly developed for uh, 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 j just for digital zero, one sort of thing. Um, but the idea here is, well, maybe you could put in an intermediate state in between a zero and a one. So by changing whether something is crystalline or amorphous, you change its resistivity. So that's heavily developed. Um, but a, 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 common, a common problem with, with both of these things is we're taking something that was developed for digital technology, mm -hmm. zero or one, and we're trying to force it into an analog technology. And to really get there, I mean, we just spent decades making sure these things were zero or one. Yes. And now we're turning around and putting them in into an intermediate step. Third technology is the one that I've actually been working on, which is called electrochemical RAM. And the idea here is to take uh, an insulator um, and, and, and intercalate an ion into it to change it into a conductor. 
And that sounds really exotic, but it turns out that your rear view mirror in your car works this way. Oh. Okay, it changes its reflectivity by changing um, from an insulator to a conductor so it reflects light, or mm -hmm. absorbs light. Mm -hmm. um, so we're doing this um, using tungsten oxide um, and placing two contacts in the tungsten oxide. The tungsten oxide sort of like a channel, just like in an FET. Um, then we have uh, a, a medium um, that contains our intercalant. In this case, it's lithium. Um, so you use an electrolyte, just like a solid state battery, and you apply a voltage and drive lithium in and out of the channel to change its conductivity. Immense challenges in, in figuring out um, what are the mechanisms, what are the retention, uh, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of materials work to be done in all three of these approaches. Fascinating, fascinating. Yeah. Um, as a researcher from industry, yeah. would you be willing to predict when some of these devices might make it into the marketplace oh. for the consumer? Oh, um, I think that will be in the scale of years, not decades, put it that way. I think uh, w one, of, one of the targets um, is that people want is, is now most of the good neural network stuff is done on servers someplace in the cloud in a server farm um, that to implement this on a chip so then it can be in a consumer device. Mm -hmm. So that's that's sort of the, the, the holy grail for this thing that we're all going to walk around with these in our pocket. Okay. okay? Fascinating, Matt. So another area that is of uh, great interest and we're seeing a lot of research activity is quantum computing of course mm -hmm. um, and from our perspective it's the materials issues that are crucial for quantum computing can you uh, describe the technology underlying yeah. the quantum computing effort and why materials are critical yeah. for this so um, there, there, there okay there are numerous different um, hardware approaches that people are taking. Um, I want to focus on one that is uh, common to several uh, uh, industrial efforts, um, which is based on uh, uh, Josephson Junction technology, okay? Low mm. temperature Josephson Junction. And the idea is as follows. You, you know we have quantum states, right, in, in, in an atom, mm -hmm. right? That's, that's what we think of as quantum states for an electron and atom. The idea here is to create a resonator um, that would act sort of like an artificial atom. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so what we do is we make a circuit um, that consists of, of a capacitor and an inductor, and that's going to resonate. But there's a big problem with that, which is if you have just a, a, a resonator conductor circuit, um, it has evenly spaced levels, right, just a harmonic oscillator, and suddenly you're not dealing with something um, with a zero or one, it's, you know, if you excite the thing, you're not going to know which of the states it's in. Right? So we want something that's just confined to two different states, sort of like an atom going, an electron going between two different states. So we put in the Josephson junction, and that's nonlinear, and that spaces out the states. All right? Makes them nonlinear, so now we have the two lowest lying states are at a discrete frequency, and we can make our artificial atom. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, the way this is done um, to actually program it is you excite it um, with microwave frequencies um, and put it in some superposition of states and let those propagate. And I will come to materials in this, uh, okay? Sounds good. Okay, so I just said microwave states, all right? So now these mugs, these are kind of nice mugs. Are, can I microwave these mugs, do you know? I think so. You think so? This mm -hmm. is the MRS uses high quality ceramics. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, if I put this in a microwave and it's not the right kind of mug, what happens? Question to you. It, it sort of heats up it tremendously. Heats up. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, what's going to happen if we have the wrong ceramic or the wrong material there, it will absorb the microwaves, right? Now, I just told you we're storing the information in this qubit as a microwave field, right? So what's going to happen is if there's anything nearby that can interact with those uh, with that microwave resonator, you will lose information. It will be in the coffee mug instead of the computer, right? This is very bad situation. 
Uh, so in fact, a lot of what's going on now is a struggle um, to improve coherence lifetimes um, and to fight against defects that limit coherence lifetimes. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, they're known as two-level systems. We don't, we don't know for sure whether they're two-level or not. That's just an early model for them. Um, but a lot of the work in terms of uh, choosing materials, uh, integration routes, and so on and so forth, and in in, in creating the, the qubit is struggling on how to avoid those sorts of losses and give a longer lifetime. Mm -hmm. Okay. So going bit, a bit further, what are the challenges for material science and where should our efforts in materials be focused on yeah. to move the field forward? So there are, there, there are a lot of different things going on here. Um, one is, is what I just described that some of the big laboratories are grappling with. Um, there are also um, opportunities in terms of different designs for the circuit. Um, we are out favor, um, we're mostly working on something called a transmon design, but we know there may be other designs that may turn out to be, uh, uh, have advantages. Um, there are also a lot of alternatives to uh, the sort of technology we're pursuing. Um, and, and it's important to have a diverse number of efforts. Um, there are people who are working on things like um, uh, uh, spin centers um, as a way of making a quantum computer, um, ion traps, a lot, of, a lot of different approaches are going on. It's important that we keep looking at all these different things because one of those could turn out to be a superior technology. We wouldn't want to miss that chance. Right. Now, another completely different angle on this involves what do you do with a quantum computer once you have it, right? Um, and there's a lot of effort goes into thinking of algorithms that can take advantage of quantum computers. Mm -hmm. and. Um, I'm sure that there will be opportunities for um, materials discovery and for material science, and the people who develop those algorithms first are going to reap the rewards. Uh, that's right? fascinating. So, yes. So I think that the, in the coming years, that'll be a great opportunity for theorists. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, that sounds fantastic, and I, I really look forward to um, seeing all the advances and breakthroughs that we will expect in, in material science, in well, I look at quantum forward computers. To taking advantage of them. Yeah, absolutely, you know? <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. Um, switching gears yeah, somewhat, yeah. Uh, you are Vice President of MRS, Materials Research Society, this year, yeah, yeah. and you will be the President next year, in 2020. What are your priorities in this position for this society, and what would you like to achieve next year? Okay, so um, one of the important things, um, the presidential term is relatively short, it's only a year, okay? So one thing that's very important is that we ma maintain continuity, because a lot of the efforts involved span many years, all right? So I've been able to help build some of the these efforts, and maybe I'll start some new ma efforts, but uh, I have no intention of um, countermanding all the executive orders of the previous president in uh -huh. the first day of office. That's not, that's not how we do things here at the MRS. Okay? Uh -huh. um, so to be specific, some of the things that are going on now, we really need to carry to execution. We've developed a new strategic plan, um, and we need to carry out some of the things in the strategic plan. Uh, one aspect of this is um, working continually improving the meetings. Uh, we're going to be looking at a new venue for the spring meeting. That's a big logistical challenge for the organization itself. We're looking at um, um, very carefully about the content um, for both meetings and tuning the content um, to meet our, our attendees' expectations. That is going to continue in the next couple of years. Okay. Um, publications, I know that we've been seeing some changes in publications, and I suspect we're going to see some more changes in publications mm -hmm. in the coming year or two. Mm -hmm. So this is another area that's a big effort, okay? So those are sort of things that were set up by the strategic plan, and we need to keep on executing. 
Um, new stuff coming up. Uh, every couple of years, we have what's called a strategic planning meeting. Um, and we have one coming in 2020. And this is an opportunity for um, the headquarters staff, um, the um, operating committee chairs, and the board to get together in one room and discuss some issues of strategic importance. All right. Um, so we're, we're, we're setting that up now, what will be discussed. Um, we may be looking at governance, how to make our governance more efficient and more nimble um, so that we can get things done at the pace we would like to get them done. Okay, okay. that's it. Thank you, Matt. Um, I really look forward to working with you and seeing all your initiatives, your actions come to fruition next year and beyond. Uh, thank you for speaking with us today. Thank you very much. Great visiting you guys.